everybody, welcome to unit two of our um, lecture series or of English 101. Um, today we're going to be talking about research questions. Um, this is going to be really important in building your argument um, when creating your research paper. Um, apologies in advance. Um, I do have a cold, so I sound a little stuffy, um, but we're just going to go ahead and get started. Um, as a reminder, there is no lecture in, um, no in-person lecture this week because it is Halloween. Um, next week we will be meeting in the library. I will make sure to send out lots of reminders about that before we go. Okay, so let's get started. So the goal of today's lecture is um, we want to help you pick a topic um, that you're interested in for your research paper. Remember, your research paper is really going to be um, the main goal of this whole um, class. So you really want to make sure that you pick a good topic. So building those foundations today is going to be really important. We want to learn how to create an effective research question. Um, some we're going to talk about the different things that you need to do to make that happen. And we want to start thinking about an argument for your research paper. Um, we're going to be talking about in a couple of weeks about building a thesis statement, um, but building these questions is what's going to help you create a really strong thesis statement. So there's a couple components to making a strong research question, um, and we're going to go over each of these individually. You want to make sure the question is open ended, that it has significance, that it's a genuine question that's neutral can be backed up by as evidence and has appropriate scope. So what does it mean to have an open-ended question? So your question should require an explanation. Um, so you wanna make sure that it can be a yes or no question, but if it's a yes or no question, it should require you to elaborate more. The trick to building an open-ended question is to use these, what I call signpost words, um, you'll see in this image here. So you want to ask what, how, where, when, why, or who. Um, just because it has, uh, just because your question starts with these words doesn't necessarily mean that it's a great open-ended question, but it is going to help you get to that point. Um, so you want to ask questions. And we're going to talk about scope. That's really important, but you want to ask open ended questions um, that allow you to um, really dive into research and questions that are not just yes or no. Is the sky blue today? Yes. Can't write 6 pages on that. Right? So you want to ask questions that are probing and um, encourage you to explore your topic. Social significance. Um, so this is really important when writing your research paper. You want to pick topics that are relevant to the current literature, if you will, or what other people are writing about. Um, you want to ask questions that um, pertain to what's happening in the world today. While you might refer to some historical context, depending on your paper, um, you don't want to necessarily be doing research on what happened 100 years ago, right? Um, when doing research in general, you want to know your audience, right? We've talked about this last week about knowing your audience. In this case, your audience is me, right? Um, and But when you're doing other research work, you want to make sure that you've got an audience that you're writing to specifically. And a lot of times that means picking topics that are socially significant. Um, so your question should be engaging and relevant. Um, so normally if we were together in class, I would have you think of a question that does not have social significance um, and does have social significance. But let me provide you with an example. So, <coughs> excuse me, a question that does not have social significance. Why does my dog um, fart in his sleep every night, right? That might be significant to you and your partner or your kids or whoever's sharing a space with your dog in the middle of the night, right? But beyond that, I don't think anybody really cares. Sorry about that. Sorry to your dog, but you get the point that I'm trying to make. There's no, nobody is quite interested in that. So a question that might have social significance 
um, might be something like, why are COVID-19 vaccination rates going down, right? And we'll talk about how to tool questions like that. That question's a little too broad, but the point that I'm trying to illustrate here is um, people are interested in hearing about that. Um, it, it has space to be part of the current conversation of what's happening in 2022, um, and people are gonna wanna read about that, right? So again, this speaks to if, you know, in, in your situation, your audience is me, your professor, and in college, nine out of 10 times, or probably 10 out of 10 times, your audience is going to be your instructor. So um, you want to speak to that, but we want to be writing about things that are relevant and have some kind of social significance. So I, I beat this like a dead horse in this class, right? You wanna ask genuine questions. That means you want to have a question um, that is debatable. You're gonna hear me say this all semester long. It has to be debatable. Your topic has to be debatable. So what does that mean? It means it has to have at least two different sides to the argument. Um, you wanna avoid questions that have a predetermined answer. Will the sun come up tomorrow? Dear God, I hope so. And unless it's the end of times and the apocalypse is coming, um, the sun is gonna come up tomorrow, right? So is that a good research question? Probably not. So we want to um, make sure that we have answer questions that are debatable, that have at least two sides to it, might have more than two sides, but you wanna ask something that's genuine. Reliable evidence, this is really important. You want to pick something that's gonna have research behind it. Um, as part of your paper, you're going to have to use or refer to or find um, five credible sources. And in general, when we're doing research beyond this research paper, you wanna make sure that you're not spreading fake news, right? We hear a lot about fake news. You wanna have a conversation with the authors in your sources that you're citing. That's the whole point of research, is to debate somebody else or add something new to the conversation. So when talking about if we stick with COVID-19, um, COVID-19 is really new and socially significant, right? Um, there's evidence out there, but more evidence is coming out day by day because even though it's been, COVID has been a thing that's been around since 2020, it's still, relatively new in terms of scientific research and data, right? So that's something to think about when you're writing. If you do decide to write about COVID-19, then realize that it might be harder for you to find um, some research materials, right? Or find some, um, some articles that support you. <coughs> Excuse me. And again, you wanna make sure that you're using credible sources there's gonna be another lecture um, that will be uploaded to talk about what a credible source is, and you're gonna to start to talk about that as well when we go to the library next week. Scope. This is probably the most important consideration when writing a research question. So you wanna find a topic that's um, not too big and also not too small. You want to pick a topic that is that is relative to um, how much you're planning to write. In this case, you're writing six pages. I know it says five pages here, but you're writing six pages, right? Um, so you're writing six pages in total. So you don't want to pick a topic that's way too big, right? So an example that I'll use, right? And, um, and I'm gonna give you an example of one too broad and one too narrow, and we're gonna do a lot of that work in the following slides as well. So um, I could say, um, why do immigrants come to the United States, right? That is way too broad. You could write, and I'm sure people have written books upon books, and, upon, and I know it's out there, right? You can spend a long time thinking about that. That might be a good place to start in terms of a topic, right? But it's not, it's not a good research question. 
So instead, I might say, okay, let's pick a geographic location to help narrow down my search. Um, so we might say, why do immigrants choose to come to New England, right? That's a little more specific. If I really want to get even more specific, which is kind of where we're headed, right? I could say what socioeconomic, socioeconomic meaning what cultural things and what economic based things. Um, so what socioeconomic factors lead immigrants to come to New England? So now I've taken something really big, my topic, and I've narrowed it down to a good research question. So really, I'm going to say what cultural things or what financial factors cause immigrants to come to New England. I might even narrow that down more and say New York. So maybe maybe my research is going to tell me that um, immigrants come into New York because, um, you know, housing is affordable, which I don't think is the case, but let's use that as an example. Um, maybe because there's already a strong immigrant population in New York. Um, maybe there's more legal resources for immigrants in New York or New England. Um, maybe culturally or politically, um, immigrants uh, are more welcomed in New England, right? So there's lots of different ways we could take that, and that's part of your research. But now we've taken something really big and tried to narrow it down to fit the scope of our paper. So now we're going to go through um, some strong research questions versus weak research questions. And I'm going to go through each question and tell you why it's strong or why it's weak. So here's the first question. What effect does social media have on people's minds? Okay. So let's look at the key terms here. Let me change my social media is a key term, and people's minds. This is a weak question, right? Because these, these ideas are way too broad. Social media, there's so many different platforms that we could be looking at in terms of social media. It's too big of a topic. And people's minds, are we talking about depression? Are we talking about, um, are we talking about, focus? Are we talking about distraction? Are we talking about, uh, I don't know, it could be so many different things, right, that we're thinking about here. I have to pause to blow my nose. Okay, so it's too big, right? Might be a good start for a topic, but not for a research question. I'm going to turn my pen off. Here's a stronger question. What effect does daily use of Twitter have on the attention span of people under the age of 16? Right? So here's what we like about this research question. Now, instead of social media, we've specifically asked about Twitter. So now we've eliminated Facebook and Instagram and TikTok and all of these social media platforms, and we've narrowed it down to Twitter. Not only that, but you'll notice here, we're also talking about daily use, right? So we're not talking about how social media over a year or over 10 years or over whatever scope, we've narrowed it down to daily use of Twitter. The other thing that we've changed is instead of saying people's minds, which is way too big, we're talking specifically about the attention span of those who are using Twitter. And to top it off, we're talking specifically about people under the age of 16, right? So next week, we're gonna talk about in the library how to use a database. And part of that is going to be talking about how to, um, use key terms to find um, articles to build your paper. If I were to use the key terms social media and people's minds, right, I would get thousands of articles. 
Now, instead, I'm talking about daily use, Twitter, attention span, and under 16. My, my field is narrowed, not too narrow, but is narrowed. I'd rather you narrow in and have to get a little bit broader than for you to be too broad. Because what's gonna happen is if you're too broad, then you're gonna get buried, you're gonna feel underwater, and it's just not effective, right? Let's look at another question. Does the US or the UK have a better healthcare system? So what specific terms do we have here? We have the US, we have the UK, and we have healthcare system, okay? These are the key terms we can pull from this question. Again, a good topic, a good starting point but still way too broad. So instead, let's look at this question. We could say, how do the US and the UK compare health outcomes and patient satisfaction among low income people with chronic illnesses? This is way more specific. Let's break it down. We're still talking about the US and the UK, right? So that hasn't changed. That's still pretty broad. But now we're looking specifically at health outcomes and patient, patient satisfaction. I would even argue for the kind of paper that you're writing, I would pick one of these, right? So you could say something like, let's take diabetes as an example. How do people in diabetes get treated in the US and the UK? in terms of health outcomes. So you might say, um, your research might find that um, patients in the US who have diabetes end up in the emergency room more often because they don't have any patient education on how to take their insulin or take care of their diabetes um, or change their, their eating habits to help their diabetes, right? Versus in the UK, they might, and I'm totally making this up, they might require that you take patient education classes as part of your healthcare package, right? Um, so that's comparing the US and the UK with health outcomes. On the flip side, you're talking about patient satisfaction, right? So you're talking about do, do people in the US and the UK, um, you know, um, do they feel like they're getting access to quality health care, right? So this is a big question that you could even chunk down into smaller research questions. To make it even better, we're not going to focus on everybody in the U.S. and the U.K., but we're going to specifically focus on low-income people with chronic illnesses, right? So instead of focusing on, you know, um, of the whole entire country, right, or countries, we're focused specifically on these kinds of people. So now, instead of in our databases looking for US and UK and healthcare systems and getting thousands of results, maybe now we're gonna say US, UK, maybe we're gonna pick health outcomes, low income people, chronic illnesses. That's gonna narrow it way, way down. Okay, let's do one more. Has there been an increase in homelessness in San Francisco in the past 10 years? I think this is still a weak question. It's a little bit stronger than the last two, mostly because we're focusing on a specific time range, right? We're focusing on a specific population, homelessness, and a specific place. So this is a little bit stronger. This is, a, um, I would say, a step above the other two questions, but I think we can still make it a stronger research question. So here, this is a beautiful chef's kiss research question, okay? We're talking about how have economic, political, and social factors affected patterns of homelessness in San Francisco over the last 10 years? You can see that we've taken what we already have, right? Homelessness in San Francisco in the past 10 years is still the same. But instead, to make it more specific, 
we've added economic, political, and social factors into our research question. What I love about this research question, you can see exactly how this paper can shape up, right? If you're using the, the five paragraph method, right? Which is, which is what you use in elementary school and high school. And, you know, it's, it's a great model. You're gonna write more than five, page, five paragraphs, most likely often in a research paper, but you can break this into five sections. Intro, economic factors of how people have been affected. You can talk paragraph two. Paragraph three is political factors of how people and homelessness have been affected. And paragraph four is going to be the social factors of how homelessness have been affected with a nice little conclusion at the end. So this really is almost like outlining or shaping up exactly how your paper is going to look. So that's what I like about this. Even still, this is still kind of big for a six page paper, but I think it's much better than the previous questions. So now we're going to look at these questions and normal if we were together in class, I would have you pick which one is too vague, which one is too easy and which one is just right. So the broad topic that you've picked in this situation is social media and fake news, right? So we're going to talk more even more specifically about fake news and the coronavirus and how it affects vaccination rates. That's just the right topic, right? It's still broad. You narrow it down just a little bit. And from there, you're able to craft your research questions. The first question is discuss, discuss the connections between social media, fake news, and the coronavirus, uh, the, the COVID vaccinations. This is a poorly worded question, but what this is saying is what impact does fake news have that's fake news that's posted on social media have on the rate of coronavirus vaccinations? And the last question, there's a large number of people not getting vaccinated based on fake news articles. Despite Facebook's effort to flag these sources, how have vaccination numbers fluctuated in the past six months? The first question, really statement, is too vague. It's too close to your topic, right? Discuss the connections between social media, fake news, and COVID vaccinations. There's a lot that can be said there, right? You could write a ton about this topic. It's too, or this research question, if you will. It's too vague. The second question is too easy to answer, right? So we could say with one statistic, um, you know, 90s, not, I don't know here, whatever the statistic might be, I'm making this up. 50% of people on Facebook did not get vaccinated based on fake news on social media. Too easy. It doesn't leave enough space to really dig in. For playing Goldilocks here, the third one is the best choice. There's a large number of people not getting vaccinated based on Facebook news articles, right? So, here we're talking specifically about Facebook's efforts to flag the sources, right? That's a little more specificity. We're also looking specifically at vaccination numbers, not only vaccination numbers, but how they fluctuated or changed in a very specific time period. We're not looking at vaccination numbers for all of from March 2020 on, we're looking at a very specific time period. So this narrows it down enough to help us get to the best potential thesis statement. And that's really what we're trying to do here, right? These research questions are gonna lead us to a thesis statement. Oops. Okay, so this is a model that not all students like to use but if you like charts and mapping and kind of looking at things, this is a great tool that you can use to help you get to good research questions and how that might be a through line or how that might translate to a potential solution or thesis statement. So you start with the issue, which is your topic, 
right? This should be broad. What is the issue or overall topic that interests you? From there, using the tools that we've talked about in this lecture, what is the specific research question, or in your case, questions, that you want to investigate? Once you've identified that, you want to identify the underlying problem. What is the problem that makes your question worth investigating? Is this an actual problem or an assumed problem? An actual problem meaning there's lots of research out there. People are saying, yes, this is a problem. Or based on your worldview or what your parents say or what your friends say or whatever, you think it's a problem, but when you go out and you start doing research, you're finding that it's not as much of a problem as you think it is, right? From there, you can talk about social significance, which is what we've talked about early in this lecture. How does it fit into the worldview? How does it fit in? Why is this an important topic to study? Why is it relevant in 2022? And then from there, you can create a proposal or a solution, which could help you get to a thesis statement. So I want to go through two of these. We're going to talk about the rising cost of education and violence in the media. So if you want to study the rising cost of education, that's very broad. It's a great place to start something you might be interested in. From that issue or topic, we're able to break it down into a research question. Is a college education worth investment for students in social sciences? Again, we are looking for some of that specificity. So instead of saying education, which really could be, what are we talking about? Are we talking about preschool? Are we talking about K through 12? Are we talking about college? Your research question is going to specify, we're talking about a college education, right? Even more specifically, we're talking about investment for students in social sciences. So instead of saying all college students, we're picking a specific field or a specific group of students. So that's the way to narrow down from issue to research question. The problem that we're seeing based on your preliminary Google search or your preliminary knowledge or things you already know is that many students are emerging from four year degree programs with staggering student debt and no job prospects, right? So now we've gone even a little more specific. We're not looking at community colleges. We're not looking at PhD students. We're looking more at four year degree programs. So you're looking at a bachelor degree program and specifically the issues that we're seeing are debt and job prospects. So you can see how we went from this big thing of education down to college education in social sciences and now we're seeing based on preliminary research that the problem is, is that students who graduate with a bachelor's degree have a mountain of student debt and low job prospects, right? For social science students. So this is important, right? Because we're looking at debt, which everybody is concerned about debt, unemployment rates and value of education, right? So your potential audience here could be, um, you know, uh, financial advisors. Maybe they're looking at to see, you know, how debt is translating for those with a college education. Um, you're looking at college professors or people in higher education who might be interested in this based on, you know, the value of education or unemployment. Maybe the government is looking at how this all plays out in terms of how debt correlates or how debt translates to job prospects and rising cost of education. So social significance is there because you've got multiple audiences that would be interested in this who want to read it. So the potential proposal or solution is that colleges should focus on critical thinking and data analysis skills um, on the social sciences curriculum. I don't know if necessarily this is where I'd go with my thesis statement, but what I like about this is, again, you're picking specific ideas, right? So maybe it's that, you know, uh, colleges who focus on this um, have critical thinking and, you know, these skills are built into their curriculum because um, job minimum qualifications for 90% of jobs, 
right, ask for these two skills. So there's a debate here, right? Um, and there is critical thinking that we've talked about. And you're able to see how an issue goes from something really big to really narrow. Not super narrow, but narrower. So let's focus on violence in the media. So the question that we're asking, we're going from broad to specific here, right, is how does violence in the media, now we're going down to how do first person shooter games affect the psychology of their players, right? Still a little too broad for me, but we've gone from the media, which could be TV shows, movies, anything, right? Now, specifically, we're talking about video games, and even more specifically, we're talking about first-person shooter games, right? The part of this question that I'm not crazy about is the psychology of their players. A little too broad for me, right? What does that mean? That could mean so many things. What I would do to, to make this a better research question is either add, maybe we're gonna talk about middle school students, right? Add a group that we're gonna focus on. Or the, the psychology, maybe we're gonna talk about um, developmental stages, right? Which you're gonna see at the end, we do eventually get to. I'm also, you know, if you have a research question that's too broad, it can change over time as you do your research. So for this week, you're gonna to have to do a discussion board post where you post three proposal questions. If your research questions look like this, that's okay. They're going to change as you do more research. But in general, to me, this is not necessarily a stellar, well put research question. So the problem we're trying to solve here is that first person shooter games reduce players level of self control and empathy, which increases criminal violence, right? So we've gone even more specific. We're keeping the first person shooter games but we're specifically talking about how it relates to players level of self control and we're talking about empathy. So now we've narrowed the psychology down even more to self control and empathy. We're not talking about suicide rates. We're not talking about depression. We're not talking about mental health necessarily. We're talking about self control and empathy, right? We can narrow it down. We have to keep in mind we're writing six pages, not a novel, right? Or a, a full long text. And we're also talking about how it increases criminal violence. Okay, so it's socially significant because we're concerned about mental health and public health. These are two things that most people are concerned about in general, right? So it, it has an audience to speak to. So the proposal is very specific here. We're talking about the enter entertainment, software, entertainment software rating board, and we're saying that they should encourage game developers to create and rate games at levels that are appropriate for the anticipated player's age and psychological development. Okay, so it's a little meaty there, right? So we want to make sure that that it's a responsibility. So your thesis could be it is the responsibility of this overseeing organization to rate games that match with psychological development, right? So that could be a potential thesis statement, right? Or a solution. So again, we're seeing how this big topic or broad idea is able to funnel down into a research question or problem. You wanna check that social significant box and then you wanna create a proposal or a solution. So, um, as part of this week's assignment, you are going to want to post on the discussion board that I've posted in the Blackboard shell, and I want you to pick one or two topics that you might be interested in researching. Um, from there, I want you to start creating research questions that you think you might want to explore. Again, there might be, you know, it might start off a little more broad, try to make it more specific, after next week and by time you hand in the research proposal assignment, which is what we're going to go over next, um, you're going to be able to create research questions that are more specific. For this week, I really just want you to start shaping those research questions. They might not be what you're going to hand in on your research proposal. I suspect that they're going to change because you're going to have more information, 
um, that's going to help you create more um, stronger research questions. But I want you guys to start thinking about this. This is going to be really important because, as I said last week, you want to make sure that you're breaking this assignment down into small pieces. It's going to be much more achievable for you to finish this assignment or finish these assignments if you break them down into small pieces. Okay. So this is the research proposal assignment. It is pretty straightforward. I put exactly what you um, are going to want to do. This is a good chunk of your grade. Um, this is not due next week. It's due the week after, I believe. Let me check on that. Um, it's in Blackboard as to when it's due. Um, so this is the assignment. Um, you want to solidify your research paper topic, research questions, thesis statement, and sources. You want to make sure that it has the following. You want to have your topic. You have to remember that this is going to be broader than your research questions, but you don't want it to be too big. Okay. Your working research project title. Create something interesting. Again, this can change as your research changes, but this is just a proposed title. Your research questions. You must have three, but no more than five, really solid, strong research questions. Again, remember everything I've gone over in this lecture to help build those research questions, right? Um, working background and thesis statement. Provide basic background on your topic and a thesis statement. There will be a whole separate lecture and a whole week that we're going to dedicate to a thesis statement and how to make a thesis statement. Also in this section, you want to pro answer, provide answers to the following questions. Why did you choose this topic to study? This is not a formal assignment in the sense that you're using a formal tone to write. We talked about tone last week. So in this assignment, you're going to say, I chose to study this topic because, right? Make sure to use that phrasing when you're answering these questions so that I know that you're hitting these benchmarks of the assignment. What is the social significance of your topic? We talked a lot about that in this lecture, so make sure to highlight the social significance. So number three is actually going to be relating to your annotated bibliography, um, start to talk about um, the article, your strongest article, right? Which article um, do you think is your strongest article that you're going to use in your paper? And the last question is, do you have concerns about writing this paper? This is more for me selfishly so that I can help you work through any concerns or issues that you foresee and we can try to think about that early on so that you don't get stuck at the end with concerns or issues. On top of that, you're going to need to cite and annotate five sources for your research paper. You're going to want to use mostly electronic sources. Next week in the library, we're going to talk about how to use a database and what that looks like. Um, you also have to use at least one book. So that means you have to cite the book. You might not read the whole book. That's okay. It might be a chapter. It might be an introduction paragraph. I want you guys to do this mainly so that you know how to use the catalog system in the library, which we're going to go over next week, so that in future research, if you want to use books, our library is a great resource for that. So you want to cite at least one book. I'm going to also have some slides and materials on what makes the source credible. OK, so look out for that lecture that's probably coming in the next couple of days. Um, so you want to make sure that you have credible sources. Um, in your annotation, I'm going to have a separate video on how to create an annotation for your annotated bibliography, which is part of this research proposal. Um, you want to answer the following questions. You want to provide a brief summary of the source. I'm talking a couple sentences, and you also want to talk about how you're going to use this in your paper. Okay, so the structure of what this piece of the assignment, there will be a separate video to go over that in this annotated bibliography video. Um, but you want to make sure to include this in your research proposal. You also want to make sure that you're using APA citation. I do this on purpose. Normally in English or writing classes, you're using MLA citation, which is most likely what you've been, you've used in high school. Um, or in your your K through 12 education in college, you are going to be using more APA citation. 
So you're going to be, sorry about my two-year-old knocking on the door in the background. Um, you are most likely in your psychology and sociology and all of those other courses are going to use APA citation. I will have some resources for you that talks about APA citation built into this course. Um, but I encourage you to also, the library has great resources. If you're struggling with APA, come see me and we can talk about it. So that is um, that is the conclusion of this lecture um, for this week. Please make sure, as I mentioned, that you watch this lecture, um, which you have. Congratulations if you've made it to this point. And please make sure you're doing your discussion board post. Um, don't forget your summary paper is going to be due next class. Um, and if you have any questions, please come see me. I will be on campus this week. I will not be in tomorrow, which is Monday for Halloween, but otherwise I will be on campus. Um, I hope you all have a safe and happy Halloween and uh, have a great day. Enjoy the rest of your day.